But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and your kingdom come, and your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. So I try to keep fit. I don't know about the rest of you. I know it doesn't look like it necessarily, but I do try to keep fit. I go to the gym. And I listen to podcasts and radio programs on playback while I'm there. A few weeks ago, I heard Emma Barnett on Woman's Hour. Obviously, she's now moved on to a different program. But she was discussing trolling. And she was explaining how she'd been a victim at a particularly difficult time of her life. She'd been off work following six rounds of IVF and enduring all that pain and heartbreak break but she had actually managed to have a daughter but she'd been suffering from postnatal depression and she'd managed to get out to the park for a walk with her baby and unusually for her had posted a photograph of the occasion on X formerly known as Twitter Amongst a number of responses she, that were posted was a particularly unpleasant one from somebody that she very vaguely remembered meeting a while back. She said it caught her unawares at a time when she was feeling really emotionally fragile. Her immediate response was to make an extremely cutting comment back. And if any of you have listened to Emma Barnett, I don't think I would have wanted to be on the receiving end of that because she's pretty sharp. But she thought for a moment, and then she responded by sending a private message saying to the person, are you okay? She received a reply almost immediately saying, what do you mean? She responded with, I wondered if you're feeling okay because you felt the need to post such an unkind comment. Is everything all right? The person then responded, with an acknowledgement that everything was not okay. And she was really, really sorry for what she'd said. She had been having a really, really bad day. And obviously, something had triggered within her to make the comment. Why do I tell that story? I think it's because it illustrates that we have a choice in how to respond to the hurts that people inflict on us. We're all different. Some of us might lash out angrily. Some of us might internalize that pain. Or we might be courageous and we might confront the person and try to sort the situation out. People do and say some really terrible things. In this church this morning, there are people here who are damaged by things that people have said to them. It might be in their family, it might be from a sibling, it might be from friends, it might be from somebody they've looked up to. And there's also damage caused unintentionally. I'm sure we've all done it, we've done things that we didn't mean to do. And it's thoughtless and careless behavior, but it can leave a mark on us. 
It might have been when you were a child or growing up, or it might have been quite recently as an adult. I think we also have to acknowledge here that before we look at how we forgive others, we are responsible for inflicting pain. We might have done things that we're aware of, but also we may have done things we're not aware of and hurt other people deeply. So forgiveness needs to be a two-way street. We need to be able to forgive others, but also to receive it ourselves. And I don't know about you, maybe I'm just talking about myself, but I think there's a bit of an inconsistency in our thinking. If we make a mistake and do something wrong, we can find reasons and excuses about why we did it pretty quickly. I know I was wrong, but I was really tired, I was really hungry, I was really stressed, the kids were playing up, I acted impulsively, lots and lots of excuses. And we usually want to be forgiven if we've done something wrong pretty quickly. Or we might choose to ignore it um, and, and try to justify what we've done to somebody else, all the while really knowing that what we have done is hurtful. However, the other way round, if somebody has hurt us, I think sometimes because we're hurt, it's easy to be offended quite easily and say, well, I'm not sure that I really do want to forgive them. They shouldn't have done it. They ought to have known better. I'd have expected more of them. Somebody in their position, they've had all the advantages of. And so sometimes there's an inconsistency. We want to receive forgiveness quickly, but we're slower to give it to somebody else. We're forgiven by Jesus. And if we could, I don't think we ever comprehend just how great that is. We, haven't, we, we have got no idea how much that cost him to die for us. It pales into insignificance when we're talking about our own situation. But when we forgive others, it does cost us. And we might need to wrestle with that a bit before we can forgive somebody else. If we've been badly hurt, we would be naive in expecting it to be simple to forgive them and not to still feel that word, but, but, I want to forgive them, but, rising when we think something's happened. We'll explore that a bit more later. So let's give this um, teaching a bit of context. The Jews were required to fast, pray, and give alms, or give to the poor. And Jews, Jesus, in this passage, is really challenging the Jews about their public demonstrations of faith. And what he's really requiring, as I read it, is that what the Jews do in private, or what we do in private, matches what we say and do in public. And I think that's quite challenging. Would you really like people to know what's going on in your head? If it just, you know, like sort of came out, would you really want people to know what you're saying, what you think, how you're feeling about certain situations? I certainly wouldn't. Um, and so the request to have our sins forgiven by Jesus is actually inextricably linked to our ability to forgive others. So we're going to look a bit at why we need to forgive other people, and then we're going to look a bit at how we might do that. So I don't know if you've read it, but in uh, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, a book that was out quite a while ago now, he explains that many people are reluctant to show mercy because they don't understand the difference between trust and forgiveness. Quite simply, we need to forgive other people because Jesus told us to. The kingdom of God is near. And in that kingdom, there is no place for grudges and pride and resentments. The only thing in that kingdom is going to be love. However, the word but comes in again here. If we forgive someone, it doesn't mean that we immediately go back to the place where our relationship was before the incident took place. Trust has to do with our future behavior and will take time to rebuild. And it takes investment on both sides. 
So Rick Warren says, if, we, if someone hurts you repeatedly, you're commanded by God to forgive them instantly, but you are not expected to trust them immediately, and you're not expected to continue, continue allowing them to hurt you. So forgiveness is not sweeping things under the carpet and saying what the other person did okay. It's not necessarily forgetting what has happened. Depending on the situation, it might require a time of healing. But forgiveness is letting go and releasing that hurt or hold somebody has over you. A friend of mine refers to um, having spheres of influence. She chooses who she wants to spend time with and who she wants to be influenced by. Those who have deeply hurt her may still be in her life, for example, in her church, in her community, in her family, but she limits the amount of time she spends with them so that the impact on her is less. So I wonder if you've ever had the situation where you've had to for try to forgive somebody who doesn't want your forgiveness, uh, your, um, who is not sorry and won't listen to you. Um, I've had that situation. I'm sure many of you have here. Um, I had a close friend in a new community um, we were living in. We met at church. Our boys became very good friends. Um, my son was six, her son was five, and we spent a lot of time together. The boys actually went to different schools, um, but in their spare time, they were together maybe three, four times a week, so they spent a lot of time. We fell out when she found out that I hadn't told her something very personal that she thought I should. She'd sort of become very inquisitive and eventually dragged something out of me that I really didn't want to tell her. <laughs> I'm quite a private person and I don't share things that are deep within me very easily. She was really angry with me. She was really off. She, could, she was incandescent with rage to begin with and then she wouldn't speak to me. And then when, we tried to, when I tried to speak to her, she was very sarcastic. She was very off with me. Um, and she wasn't able to hear what I was trying to say. I was trying to explain to her why I hadn't shared what I, what I didn't want her to know, or anyone else to know for that matter at that point. Um, and I wanted to apologize for upsetting her. The rift in our friendship spilled over to our boys. Suddenly the boys were not allowed to play together because she wouldn't let them. And it was really hard. And I wrestled with this a lot. I cried, I prayed, cried some more, um, read my Bible, and pondered on Jesus' teaching about logs and splinters in the eye. Um, and eventually I decided that the best approach was to try to reach out to her with a handwritten letter that she could read and she could digest in her own time. This was a real risk because I felt really hurt and vulnerable. And also, I felt quite angry. I felt like it wasn't my fault. Actually, I felt she was being totally unreasonable. But I did want to forgive her and I wanted to repair the relationship. After a couple of days' reflection, she got back to me and she responded positively to the letter. So the initial, if you like, forgiveness thing was sorted. Um, you know, I felt that she had forgiven me, I had forgiven her. But the trust took a lot longer to build and a, a long time. And we still saw each other quite a lot. The boys played together. And then a couple of years later, we moved. Ten years later, um, I met her again, and she had moved to our area. And she explained to me that that letter had had a profound effect upon her. It had really helped her to think about her reaction to when she was hurt and upset. And she had, if you like, used that in dealing with other people, because obviously it was a problem for her. Um, I don't want to say what the issue was, but it was very personal to her. And we grew really close together again. Um, and I really believe that was God's doing because what happened to her and her family later 
was really challenging, but that's a different story for a different day. So if you have me back, I might tell you it. So why must we forgive others? Um, because we're commanded to do so. We're told to do that. It's preparation for the coming of God's kingdom. It's a demonstration of God's grace working through us. And it's really good and healthy to release hurt and pain and allow God to actually heal us, even if the other party doesn't want to acknowledge that pain that they have caused us. So forgiving others, how do we do it? Well, sometimes a quick, I'm really sorry, will do. But sometimes it doesn't, and that's what I'm going to address now. It's really important to acknowledge the pain that you feel and not to just try and ignore it, not to sort of try and Christianize it and sort of say, well, I shouldn't be feeling like this. I should be feeling full of love and joy when this person has really upset me. It's very important to acknowledge our feelings um, and acknowledge, and a word of warning, acknowledging that can actually make it feel worse to begin with. You can actually feel really angry, really upset, really in pain. And if it keeps coming back and back in your mind, that's a sure sign that it's a real problem. It's very important, though, not to numb yourself or to push it down and pretend it hasn't happened because that pain will remain in you and it will resurface at some point maybe with that person, maybe with somebody else in the future. Um, just don't know when it's going to resurface. So you have to, at some point, address that pain. It might help to write a journal or to discuss with a friend confidentially. Um, and being real about how you feel is really important in that conversation. Not trying to sort of say, well, I know I should really love them, but, or whatever. But actually being real with that person and saying, I'm finding this difficult. And then imagining being on the other side. What does it feel like to be that person? Have we asked somebody else to forgive us at a different time? What did that make us feel? Did the person forgive us? Do we have a problem with forgiveness? The Bible directs us to do what others would have them do to us in Matthew 7, 12. And so it can be really helpful to put ourselves in the shoes of the other person for the moment. Obviously, we need to remember Jesus' forgiveness. Jesus has forgiven us so much. Can we follow his example? This is another step in the process. and doesn't mean we're necessarily ready to forgive the person but we need to reflect on what Jesus has done for us and what he's asking us. And even if you're not able to physically communicate with that person, it may be somebody who you're no longer in touch with or somebody who has died, it is still possible to forgive that person for what they've done. We had a very difficult time a few years back um, Chris and I, in our church. Someone caused us a lot of pain, uh, both verbally and written. They were a church leader. And they did it in a very public way, so our, our entire church family knew. They were completely unconcerned about the pain that they caused. And I really wrestled with this. We really res wrestled with this because I was a church leader myself. But as I prayed, God showed me something really, really important that was key to me. He showed me that I am only responsible for my behavior. I can't control somebody else's behavior, but I am responsible for how I respond. So I chose to treat this person with respect, with dignity, give them a cup of tea, treat them completely normally and I chose not to gossip and a lot of people knew what was going on because churches are like that people sidling up to you sort of having a little chat but I chose not to gossip because I believe that was what Jesus was asking me to do high personal cost but actually high integrity too I believe they will have to account for their behavior one day as I will have to account for my behaviour one day. 
And it's a process of forgiving. It's taken a long time to forgive this person. So reflecting on our biblical command, Jesus stressed the importance of forgiving others on so many occasions and included it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against against us. Praying that through and reflecting on that is really helpful. And then, when you get to the point of forgiving somebody, letting go of the hurt, and I think this is maybe one of the most difficult things, the devil is an expert at getting a foothold when we've made the choice to forgive and the wound is still sensitive. We have to let go of that pain and choose to move forward. This is where prayer is essential. And sometimes we can't do it on our own. Obviously, we can ask the Holy Spirit to help us. But you may also need somebody to walk with you to keep reminding you to actually take it back to God. Choosing each day to forgive the person. Choosing not to be bound and constrained by the pain they caused, but actually to be free. Forgiveness is more than just saying a prayer. It's a process we take to move on. It's always going to be difficult if it's deep and painful, but it's really worth it in the end. Our friend Peter, not as in my friend Peter, but I mean the Apostle Peter, he was just so great, wasn't he? He always used to say what he he thought was the best thing to say at the time. So Peter asked Jesus how many times he might need to forgive someone And in a really grandiose gesture, Peter suggested seven times, which he thought was really great. Unfortunately, um, and he he thought he was being clever here because the actual, um, the Jews, the the Pharisees taught that you needed to forgive somebody three times. Any more than that was not necessary. You'd done it by three times. So Jesus' answer, which, which probably most of us are familiar with, no, 70 times seven. So 490 times at least. So I think why Jesus said that was his, his, um, his pointing to his unlimited grace as opposed to the confines of the law. He's saying, my grace, I forgive over and over and over again. I, will, I can forgive everybody for what they have done if they come to me. So every day we can go to him and know that we will be forgiven if we are sorry and repent, old-fashioned word, but come before God and acknowledge our sins. So Matthew 5, 44 says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Ask God to reveal his love to the person who has hurt you. And ask him, too, to dissolve the negative emotions. I found this a really powerful way in moving forward, actually praying for that person, imagining what God wants to do in their life, asking God to help them to move forward. So Jesus wants us to live our lives where we're following him and we're learning from him. He wants us to forgive others as we are forgiven, even if it's really hard to do. He wants our inner lives to match our outer lives. He gives us his spirit, the counsellor, to help us to live our lives in accordance with his teaching. All we need to do is to ask him to help us. So in a moment, um, James is going to come and lead us in our communion and our confession. But I'd just like us to reflect on a couple of questions for a few moments. Is there someone I need to forgive? Is my heart hardened due to the pain that others have caused me? Have I caused others to struggle and experience pain due to my own words and actions? So just We'll have a moment of silence just to reflect and give God whatever comes to mind. Don't sort of root around and try and find something. Just allow God to speak to you.